Well, I'll be. Season 3 sure came and went, didn't it? Honestly, the fact that I was even able to finish an entire season's worth of reviews within one year's time is a mind-blowing achievement in my eyes considering it took me practically double that amount for the other two seasons that came before it. <laughs> well, that's what happens when college doesn't eat away all of your time, you know? That, and a more determined slash work-oriented mindset. Season 3 was... Well, honestly, I'm not quite sure. There's something about this season that just doesn't feel as connected to me as the previous ones were. Oh, it's certainly better than season one by a considerable margin, but I think it might actually be inferior to season two. I don't know, something about the memorability of the season two episodes just sticks with me a lot more than most of the episodes I covered this past season. Even season one was more memorable in my eyes in that sense because of how terrible those episodes were. At least that allowed it to stand out. Most of these episodes were mediocre and insignificant, and that's more of a detriment because in a way, it's less fun than the absolute shitfest that the show started out as. The well certainly ran dry by the time season 3 rolled around, because this season barely introduced any new interesting villains, failed to capitalize on most of the pre-existing ones, and all around was filled with rather bland stories to follow. I'ma just say this now, Ragnarok and Roll, In the Doghouse, Brain Freeze, Mojo the Great, these are all episodes that didn't even qualify as honorable mentions on either side. Even Him's episode, Our Brand is Chaos, was less enticing than Imagine That or Power of Four from the prior season. The show started hitting that point where it was just bland, dull, lifeless, not outright terrible, obnoxious, in-your-face garbage. I'm not necessarily saying I want the reboot to be that, but I'm at least saying I was able to have more fun ripping it apart. Season 3 was also faced with the trend of ending so many of its episodes at such a rapid pace. A multitude of episodes felt like they accelerated at such a brisk rate and then just slammed into a brick wall at the end. Several of the plots were plagued with unsatisfactory endings that really hindered the overall experience. I know people say it's more about the journey than the destination, but a good chunk of these episodes never actually arrive at the destination. It's more like they overshot the runway and ended up crashing in a massive explosion. This season also made me detest Buttercup on a level I never would have come to expect back when I was starting out. I knew there was bias towards her in seasons 1 and 2, and I think it kind of started in season 2 especially, but it excelled tenfold in this one. Some positives though, there were fewer animation errors even if they weren't outright gone, Mojo finally secured his place as the girl's main antagonist again, and of course I'll be getting into more specific things with the episodes I've chosen as the best of the best. Ah, it is such a relief to finally be finished reviewing every individual episode of this dreadful, dreadful show. A part of me still can't believe I did it, and in all honesty, season 3 absolutely flew by. Perhaps that's another reason this season was less memorable to me. I did power through the thing at a much faster rate, and some of my reviews feel like a total blur. I honestly can't even remember making some of them. So, it's possible I've also just gotten to the point where I've made so many Powerpuff 2016 reviews that they just sort of blend together in my head. I finally figured out a super efficient method for managing my time, planning things out, getting various aspects of the video production process done way in advance, and I have no regrets about that though. That was seriously a big help for season 3. Now usually, this is the part where I'd run down all of my thank yous and whatnot because my previous top 5s have essentially been the season finale videos before I begin covering the next wave, but considering that there are no more reboot episodes to cover and I still have several more bonus videos to put out after this, I'm going to hold off for now and just save that for a later date. Of course, as always, I appreciate everybody's kindness and support all the same, and hope you've enjoyed the ride so far. I also appreciate you sitting through my little ramble here at the beginning before delving into the top five. My coverage of the reboot isn't over yet, however, so to kick off this wave of bonus videos, let's get right into the top five best and worst episodes of the Powerpuff Girls 2016, Season 3. But first, some honorable mentions. I'm looking for my sisters, Blossom and Buttercup. They look like about my height, my eyes, my face, my dress, but different. Oh, forget it. They're impossible to describe. 
Kicking things off, we have The Maze Days, the third part of this season's 45 minute long television special, Small World. The Maze Days primarily focuses on the journey that Bubbles takes to acquire her corresponding Heartstone, and is easily the most fun out of the three because it allows Bubbles to just be herself. In a sense, the Bubbles we know isn't gone here. While Small World as a whole is just sort of decent, this episode in particular is one I would certainly deem good. The book says I need one of her pigtails. Cool costume. Do you know where Elm Street is? Don't you see I'm busy? <laughs> Not only is it the best Powerpuff Girls Halloween special in existence, but Witch's crew actually makes Princess Morbucks tolerable. After Princess accidentally turns herself into a fire-breathing ogre and the Powerpuff Girls into evil witches, she and Mojo have to go around on a scavenger hunt collecting various items for their antidote brew to turn everybody back to normal. Seeing her bounce off of Mojo's character made for some pretty unique chemistry we don't see in this show too often, and I definitely wish we got more episodes with them together. It also doesn't feature her gang, which is an added bonus. You know, after giving this some thought, I think Lights Out is worthy of being recognized as a positive honorable mention, even if I didn't find the episode as exciting as I had hoped it would be. I might have been a bit harsher on this in my review than I should have been looking back. Despite having the worst case of too many running gags in one episode, this was a fitting end to Silico's arc after being built up over the course of three seasons. The ultimate ending is surprisingly dark yet satisfying given that he's essentially trapped in his own fantasy where he defeated the girls for the rest of his life. This is also the final appearance of Bliss, and for once she actually gets treated as an equal to the girls, rather than being placed up on a higher pedestal. The supporting role is a good fit for her, and I mean that sincerely. If she had been like this in more episodes of the series, I think it would have worked out for the better. You know the deal. Deliver the pizza in 30 minutes, or it's free. You better hurry. <laughs> in the Gangrene Gang's only legitimate starring appearance over the course of 120 episodes, Hustle Cup features Ace hustling Buttercup into getting her dad's latest invention by beating her in a game of horse. While I do feel the rest of his gang is extremely underutilized, it was still great seeing them again committing a small-scale crime. The only aspects I don't like are the disorienting horse gag and the professor's muscles, but at the very least I appreciate the moment where he actually sticks up for his kids for once. Also, it's a pretty weird coincidence that Ace just so happened to be playing basketball here when that's the exact same thing he was doing in the Gorillaz music video that came out shortly after this episode had aired. So I know how divisive this pick is, but Salamander is one of those episodes that I seriously appreciate because of its purposeful use of overly stupid outcomes to illustrate parody. I know some people disagree with me, saying that it wasn't done with intent and that I was giving the episode too much credit. However, the presentation of the grunt giving the girls Salamander's whereabouts and the stuffed toys causing these vehicles to explode makes it clear to me this was definitely intentional. I get that this isn't everybody's cup of tea, but to me personally, I really like that aspect of it. It knows how to exaggerate without going overboard, and the entire situation makes sense given that the main antagonist is the most incompetent villain in the reboot's rogues gallery. I do agree that Bubbles' blatant mistreatment of Blossom is rather unforgivable to an extent, and the justification for Buttercup's inability to lead is just flat out unexcusable, but there's another episode on here that does it way worse in my opinion. I can overlook those small shortcuts for the greater scale of the episode. And likewise, I have some dishonorable mentions to acknowledge as well. Ice madness? You mean polar paranoia? The chilly silly? The frozen phobia? The below zero fero? Huh, never heard of it. 
So I complimented the Maze Days just now for being the best segment of the Small World special. Consequently, Stone Cold Spider is easily the worst of the four. Between forced conflict to an illogically complicated plan to fool Sumna to basically no effort required for Buttercup to acquire her Heartstone, I really do not admire the way this one was handled. This feels like the polar, pun intended, opposite of everything the Maze Days stood for. There's so much contrivance that I can't do it all justice here, so check out my full review of Small World for details. Of course, the same can be said for all of the episodes that I'm talking about in this video, but you get what I mean. Princess raps, stock footage, the girls can't sing, but then they can, Jared shows up at one point, this isn't how video editing works, terrible song parodies, armor that isn't indestructible, moving on. Rebel Rebel is one of those episodes that really feels like everything but the moral was an afterthought. The reboot wanted to send a message about peer pressure and nothing else mattered to it. Not even the title, which I still to this day cannot figure out the significance of. The character of the Beaker Boys is also so incredibly one note. They have zero personality, zero defining traits, and three of them seem pretty much pointless because only the one that looks like my astronomy professor from my sophomore year of college does all the talking. The professor's motive also changes at such a breakneck speed. At the very least, there's kind of a monster fight in the middle there, but that's not enough to save it. But this invitation is just for Mr. Mackerbacker. Okay, see ya! Cool, this table's got a shirt. One of the worst cases of the reboot shoving in a forced love story plot, Can't Buy Love has 11 minutes dedicated to nothing but Princess fawning over Barry while he has absolutely no clue what's even going on because he's more fascinated by tables wearing shirts. Nothing in this episode justifies that these characters have a connection to each other. It's shallow, is what it is. And the fantasy sequences are so uncomfortable to watch. I honestly don't see how a kid is going to find this enjoyable in any sense. Princess's his heartbreaker armor is still uncanny and disproportionate looking which really takes me out at the end and I easily found her character to be at her most annoying out of every other episode we've seen this season. Barry's awesome, but that's about it. It may be weird, it may be dumb, but the death ball way is my way. You gotta believe in something. We can change the rules without changing who we are. I've really come to loathe Malin over the course of the series run. I chalked up Buttercup vs. Math to being a fluke, but my god did the long skate home royally warp my perception of her in such a negative manner. The entire conflict has Malin stuck in her ways while Blossom questions everything because it makes no sense and then Malin gets offended even though Blossom was offering valid suggestions and criticism to solve their predicament. If Malin wants to handle the situation her way, she's allowed to do that, but Blossom also has that same right Right, considering she's the one with the video proof. The fact that Malin criticizes her for wanting to do things a more efficient way is flat out stupid, not to mention the fact that she doubles down on her stance the entire episode, until the very end where she changes her mind lickety split and does what Blossom suggested whilst also giving her no credit for it. The whiplash comes out of nowhere, I have no idea why the episode was trying to present this as a profound moment for Malin's character, because she's super obnoxious, and the episode isn't even classified as a Blossom episode when it clearly should be. Yeah, there's nothing to like about this one. The more I've thought about it, the more I've come to realize that Save the Date really is one of the best Miss Keen episodes I could ever ask for out of the reboot. 
Considering how underutilized the character was across the series, the fact that her only starring role actually ended up being one of the best of the season gives me a huge sense of relief because at the very least, the one time it did decide to use her character, it didn't flanderize her completely. At first, I was apprehensive. As many of you know, I absolutely loathe the way the Powerpuff reboot handles episodes focusing on characters wanting to date and having romantic relationships, but Save the Date seems to be the sole exception to that rule. The relationship aspect of the episode actually gets placed on the back burner after its initial setup because the focus is more on Miss Keen discovering her own self-worth and gaining a sense of confidence after realizing she is more important than she gives herself credit for. This is an episode about her self-discovery, not her going on a date. She seems to be experiencing some confidence issues at the beginning of the episode. Clearly, she must have some sort of struggle with anxiety considering her shaky yet optimistic behavior. The way the episode depicts her nervously walking to her date, or even before that with how she reacts around the girls, tells me that the reboot was trying to portray her as a little more than just nervous. Anxiety clearly runs through her veins, and that is accurately portrayed as such. This is further accented by all of the citizens pointing at her and casting her out when she turns into a giant 50 foot monster and gets chased away to Monster Island. Maybe it's a bit too literal, but it still showcases how affected she is by other people's perception of her. It's almost as if she's so reliant on the approval of others that she can't function without it. There's no comfort in not knowing what other people are thinking of her every second of the day, and clearly this is a problem that many people like her struggle with. Getting pointed at and called a monster in front of the entire city? Yeah, that's definitely not going to feel good, especially considering she was already dealing with a heavy amount of stress as she was just walking to her date. To be turned into a giant 50 foot monster on top of that? Yeah, that's rough. I really, genuinely do appreciate how the episode then turns around after the girls try to show her how meaningful she is to their lives. I mean, Miss Keen got to the point where she wanted to quit teaching students altogether and just focus on creating a new life amongst all of the other monsters on the island. This is my place now, here with you. <laughs> what am I doing? Those are my girls out there. They need me. The fact that Miss Keen realizes how ridiculous she's acting and decides to step up because she sees her students in danger showcases how she takes her responsibilities as a teacher super seriously and it kind of snaps her out of it because it uses her comfort zone of teaching to bring her out of it in a way. I like that seeing her students in danger causes her protective instincts to kick in and snap her out of it because that's what overrides her own fears of being judged. That was a very smart writing choice and perfectly fits in line with Miss Keen's character. I especially like how the monster battle with the giant ant essentially serves as the gateway event into building up her confidence so that she feels like she can take on the entire world. And it's a decent monster fight too. This is further cemented when she not only goes to meet her date, but she does it while looking like an absolute mess and not caring. She puts herself out there after going through a lot that night and her date is fully accepting of it. That's a sign that she's found a good match. And this is another thing, the fact that the show actually decided to portray Miss Keen's partner in a positive light rather than making him out to be a complete jerk also does a great service to the episode. Todd here is a loyal, caring person and definitely a good match for Miss Keen it seems. The way that everybody else in the town treats him like a loser is despicable but that's nothing new for the town citizens, so I'm glad that the two of them actually get to end their evening in each other's company after all of the torment that they've both been through that night. Other moments I like include Mojo's conversation with Keen when she initially gets the toxic waste dumped on her, as well as the fact that this is a Powerpuff Girls episode where saving the city is actually a priority. Even if the choreography with the Powerpuff Girls themselves sucks, I mean, there's legitimately no excuse for the part where Bubbles just stops for no reason so that she's forced to get hit, I'm just relieved to see some action taking place. All in all, aside from the obviously strange choice to have Keen grow to a colossal size, I do like this episode. If you look past that nonsense, you can actually see a heartfelt attempt at making Miss Keen a sympathetic character. And as I said, this is her only starring episode in the entire series run, so knowing that information, save the date is almost everything I could ever ask for. Except for the growing to a colossal size part, that still makes me feel queasy. <laughs> Is this?
mission for you, fiends. I shall reward the villain who defeats the Powerpuff Girls with a bounty of one million dollars. You know who I can't stand? The Professor. But we're not there yet. You know who else I can't stand? Buttercup, and it's all thanks to the sheer amount of kiss-assery that has plagued the reboot practically ever since the very beginning. Anyone who's followed this series as much as I have will clearly have noticed by now that the PPG reboot has an unsung bias towards the rascally green princess, and the fog is easily one of the worst cases of her getting away with something she clearly doesn't deserve to. Indignation doesn't even begin to describe how I feel about this episode. The Fog fixates on this idea of a random assortment of antagonists in Townsville all getting invited to some sort of supervillain gathering in order for them to come together to destroy the Powerpuff Girls once and for all. The catch? The criminal mind behind the whole operation is Buttercup herself, disguised as this thick puff of smoke going by a secret alias, The Fog. Ooh, how mysterious. Several people have cited this as what is essentially just the wrong version of Moral Decay because unlike that episode which actually punished Buttercup for getting away with beating up innocent people and profiting off of it, this episode actually embraces and encourages it. And you know, the more I've thought about that, the more I've come to agree with it. So to further explain what that means, about halfway through the episode after the villains have already failed to defeat the girls, Buttercup threatens to use force against them if they don't put up a legitimate fight while still disguised as the Fog. As soon as they leave the room, however, she drops her disguise and reveals herself to nobody but the audience, which is all too predictable that it's impossible to not see coming, by the way. And her sisters also happen to conveniently catch her in the act at that exact moment. So that's fine and dandy. Buttercup is caught, sure. But then a giant metal dinosaur shows up and practically murders her sisters, which causes Buttercup to cry and confess that she's guilty in front of it, even though she doesn't know who's in the giant metal contraption anyway. Anyway, so it's not like it would mean anything to a real supervillain. Under any other circumstances, this should not have worked out. But because it just so happens to be the professor in there, she's not actually in harm's way, even though he practically murdered Blossom and Bubbles. Some father, right? Hi, Buttercup! Blossom! Bubbles! You're okay! Oh, you know I'd never really hurt the girls. The professor calls her out on what she was doing, which is good. She definitely deserves punishment. But then it all falls to pieces when all the villains show up because instead of punishing her, he actively encourages her to go beat them up. I said this exact quote in my review, but I'm gonna say it again. The entire idea here is that it was wrong of Buttercup to provoke these villains and encourage others to do bad things just because she selfishly wanted to cause them physical harm for her own enjoyment. In essence, the professor and the show itself just said, yeah, we know what you did was wrong, but you can keep doing it anyways and we fully support you. This is like if a bully were to be caught bullying somebody by an adult, but instead of the adult reprimanding them, they just say, well, you already punched your victim in the face, may as well break their legs while you're at it. Buttercup was pushed pushing for an excuse to beat people up this entire episode. And then when she's caught encouraging that behavior, the professor essentially decides that her punishment should be to get what she wanted all along. The moral is literally boiled down to, if you start something, you gotta finish it, but like what the fuck kind of moral is that? That's not true at all. What, if somebody starts to vandalize one house, they should go ahead and do the whole neighborhood? If somebody walks up to a bridge, they should go ahead and jump? If someone drives towards a pedestrian, they should continue to run them over? How in any way does this episode show that instigating people to do harmful things is wrong? This is one of Buttercup's most selfish episodes, and the show actively encourages her behavior by rewarding her with the goal she was trying to achieve through her vile plan the whole time. She literally has a moment of epiphany where she says she's sorry, and then she just goes back to her old self and does it anyways. What was even the point? I get that some people dislike Moral Decay's conclusion, but I think that has the perfect punishment. In that episode, Buttercup got exactly what she deserved, and the people she affected got justice. Here, the villains get beat up unbeknownst to them that the person beating them up was the one that threatened to hurt them if they didn't beat up the Powerpuff Girls in the first place. Buttercup literally forces these characters into a, I'm going to physically harm you and there's nothing you can do about it scenario. If they fight, they get beat up. If they don't, they get beat up. And the show actively promotes Buttercup's side of this. 
It's disgusting. The bias towards Buttercup is already strong enough as it is, but this episode pushes it too far. I'm so sick and tired of this selfish shit character getting what she wants, saving the day while the other two just watch. The list goes on and on and on with how unbelievably biased it is. I mean, even the title cards are weighed in her favor. Like, come on. I understand that Blossom didn't get as many episodes as the other two girls in the original, but at least it was pretty balanced between Buttercup and Bubbles. There were several episodes this season that easily should have been recognized as Blossom and Bubbles episodes, but no, they only get one and Buttercup gets four. That's fair, right? Ugh, I'm just so sick of the Buttercup favoritism in the show because most of the time her getting what she wants is unjustified, unsatisfying, and unwarranted. Blossom may have been claimed to be the favorite at one point, but the show itself certainly doesn't emulate that in the slightest. I also think the fact that this episode failing to really capitalize on the supervillains conglomerating together is a huge detriment because villain team-ups are usually an exciting event to watch. Multiple antagonists coming together usually results in witty banter, a more challenging threat, and creative ideas that might not be possible if the characters were by themselves. It's a shame, because I would have rather watched an episode all about that over what we actually got. Here, the villains are more or less in the same room together, but they all act separately instead of coordinating anything with their counterparts. They don't bounce off of each other, and there's a noticeable lack of charisma. The fog, honestly, could have been something great, but instead, it's in the top five worst of the season, and that's a damn shame. <laughs> Shocker, I know, considering how much I disliked the way the ending was handled, but Total Eclipse of the Cart still manages to come in at the number 4 spot for me. Considering that more than 50% of the episodes had such rapid and vapid endings, the 90% prior to the climax of Total Eclipse has a lot going for it. Even though the ending of something can usually make or break the entire experience, I still appreciate what this and the next best episode I talk about managed to do prior to their endings. I could be wrong about this, but I feel like Total Eclipse would have made for a great season 3 premiere finale, especially considering its overall premise. The Powerpuff Girls and a substantial portion of their rogues gallery all partake in a wacky racers parody in order to obtain whatever happens to be in this mysterious box that the mayor found when trying to install his hot tub. I want to call this episode a love letter to the reboot's tiny pool of followers because, in a way, this acts as a grand summary of the show. So many characters show up here, between the girls and the professor, the villains, Donnie, Poseidon, the mayor, dude, even Fuzzy and the Rowdy Rough Boys get cameo appearances here. Things are also on a much greater scale. I mean, that Jemica twist that happened at the end of part one was something I never saw coming, and despite my sheer awe at such an absurd game changer, it did enhance Jemica beyond just being an Indiana Jones knockoff. The fact that she was actually an evil demon empress trapped in a girl's body is a neat idea and is accented by her previous episodes where she was clearly trying to obtain ancient artifacts in order to obtain power. Now, her motivation makes a little bit more sense. A little ridiculous and over the top, sure, but looking back now that the shock has worn off, I'd say that it wasn't the worst choice imaginable. Whether this idea was planned from the beginning or only came together later in the series run, it still works because there aren't any gaps in continuity as far as I'm concerned. It certainly helps that she only had two episodes prior to this one, but hey, usually fewer appearances is a good thing in cases like this. It also gives more credence to her whole ancient artifacts thing as I mentioned. Jamore, her demon name, poses a mostly legitimate threat in the way that she manages to turn the mayor to sand, knock the girls down effortlessly, and raise a giant army to take over Townsville. I love how the girls and Mojo are forced to come together in order to take down the bigger threat, and I enjoy the plan they formulate, and that opening action shot where Blossom and Buttercup are seen flying towards her army was surprisingly dynamic for this show. If the reboot had been given more opportunities to focus on the action and do things like this, I'm sure that would have aided in the show's overall quality quite dramatically. What else do I love? Well, the song that the girls sing that's an obvious parody of I Want to Dance with Somebody by Whitney Houston. Somebody 
Seriously, I still catch myself humming this every now and again. No other song from the reboot has stuck with me as much as this one has. Although, there are other worse ones, unfortunately. And not only that, but the background score as well is great. The music that plays during the kart racing scenes really sticks out in particular. Like, this is the only episode where I actually notice the score enhancing the events of the episode rather than just being reusable filler noise you hear in, like, every other episode. The kart race has its own theme now, and it's really easy to recognize while watching. It also perfectly emulates the feeling of a race with its fast tempo. I really like how Donnie gets beat up a ton in this episode too, between Bubbles running him over with her car and him getting struck by lightning, as well as almost drowning. I want to say this decision was intentional, but I don't know for sure. I didn't mind Poseidon showing up either, seeing as he was tied to the previous Gemica episode from season 2, the Buttercup job. The backgrounds that we see Bubbles drive through, those being the dig site from Frenemy and Atlantis from the aforementioned Buttercup job, were also great subtle tie-in references that I appreciated because of their connections with the main antagonist. That sort of attention to detail is fantastic and should have been present way more often in the reboot. It's very clear to me how much more effort was given towards producing Total Eclipse of the Cart relative to almost all other episodes, which further makes me believe this was meant to be an opener or closer for the season. The only major gripe I have is with, again, the ending. The way that Jamore gets defeated simply by the clouds rolling out of the way with no explanation so that the Decelerae can conveniently use its solar power to freeze her in place is a sloppy ending, all things considered. Jamore had complete control over the weather, so how did she lose it? The Decelerae was established to only slow things down, not freeze them in place, and this is further backed up by the name, so how did it freeze her outright? And why did she just get left in the desert never to be heard from again? It's a very anticlimactic ending to an otherwise grand event. As I said though, ending aside, there is a lot of fun to be found here. Just watching all of the villains actually compete with each other, watching them wreck and drive off cliffs ending with cartoonish explosions, it's pretty fun. Yeah, Total Eclipse of the Cart certainly earned my respect as being the best extended special the reboot has produced. Definitely the one most worth watching for sure. <laughs> Oi, oi, oi. So here we have the spoon. Ugh, arguably Bubbles' worst role in the entire show. This episode features her rising to power as an evil dictator after a mysterious spoon appears in the center of Townsville without any explainable reason. Where to even start with this one? Well, I guess we can begin by acknowledging the blatant ignoring of continuity. Tooth or Consequences, an episode from season 2 of the reboot, established that Bubbles was a pristine toothbrusher unlike any other. You girls have your teeth cleaning appointment at the dentist today. I love the dentist! They make your teeth all shiny, and you get a toy afterward. She took great care of her teeth, so much so that the dentist office made her the official smile of the month. This episode somehow manages to completely screw that up and portray her as somebody who hates taking care of her teeth, and even then, the justification for that is poorly thought out. The episode begins by having her complain that she hates the way that orange juice tastes after brushing her teeth. But there are so many ways around this that it isn't even something she should be complaining about. A. She could just wait a longer time after brushing her teeth before eating and drinking. B. Other foods can make things taste gross too. I used the example of chocolate in my original review, so it's really not to say that toothbrushing is the only culprit of this. And C. She could just brush her teeth after she finishes eating, not before. That's what most people do anyways, like why is this even a problem for her? This being the justification for her rise to power in the episode is abysmal, logically speaking, and it just makes her eventual actions all the more despicable because it isn't warranted, it isn't believable. Nobody's going to sympathize with this. What does Bubbles do exactly? Well, after persuading three people via coincidence and sheer dumb luck, she manages to get the citizens of Townsville to form a spoon-worshipping cult that casts out any and all dentists. Toothbrushes are outlawed, dentists are one 
killing criminals, and this all happens within a time span of 24 hours. One day. That's it. That's the entire amount of time the episode expects you to believe all of this dystopian change managed to take place and establish itself over. We follow the chain of events through Blossom, who was also absent throughout most of this and as such is just as confused as we are. She eventually meets up with Bubbles to question her about all this, but in this time, her sister has managed to become so power hungry over this teeth brushing thing that she literally has the entire society manipulated into following her every command, all because she claims she could whisper to the spoon on the news. We also come to find out that Bubbles' teeth have rotted and her breath reeks, despite the fact that the episode presented us with the fact that she literally brushed her teeth the previous morning, and a previous episode showcased how she took great care of them. Oh, and let's not forget about the other side of the story. Dr. Martin the dentist and his ragtag group of dentist friends who dress up as tooth troopers in a half-hearted, low-effort attempt at Star Wars references. Let's see, there's also this running gag with Buttercup having a stand where she sells uniforms and weapons to both sides of this feud and that's all she's good for, which I can't complain about, but it gets old quick and is repeated too many times. Three wasn't enough for this episode, apparently. The original series did a much better job parodying Star Wars because it took the original concept and put a twist on it. Instead of it being a Death Star, it's a giant disco ball that's blocking out the sun, and it's totally in tune with the fact that the Boogeyman is all about dancing. It's perfect. It makes total sense because it's not just doing what the original film did. This here is much more literal. It's just two sides fighting each other. Like, there's nothing clever about putting an epic twist on the original formula of Star Wars at all. There's also a point where Bubbles attempts to burn Blossom alive, which I'm not going to get started on again, but just the way the episode depicts her as though she's actually going to go through with it is cruel and unusual punishment. Some have told me that having a sister will make them want to burn their sibling alive from time to time, and metaphorically sure, of course that's true. I've had my own fights with my sister, but the episode's tone and Bubbles' direction is directly demanding that Blossom be burned and murdered. She isn't being metaphorical at all. Blossom gets captured, Bubbles says burn her alive, and then a dude tries to light her on fire but fails because he's using a spoon. You shall be burned! Does anyone have a match? This is a spoon. Admittedly, that last portion was funny, but aside from that, I just don't see how Bubbles can be liked in this episode when she turns on Blossom and tries to have her killed, all because she stood up against this whole spoon craze. The final realization that Bubbles is not the Spoon Lord also brings the episode to a complete halt because some random woman comes out of nowhere at the climax of the episode to take it away, and Bubbles just says, Oh, I'm not the Spoon Lord. The end. No punishment for all of the awful things she's done, no resolution or lesson learned, not even a comedic beat. The end result is nothing, nothing, but Buttercup getting rudely raided because the customer she sold to demanded refunds and took their money back without being civil or even considering whether or not they were entitled to one. Does the episode say they can't get a refund? No, but it doesn't say they can either, and that doesn't excuse their raiding and shouting to overwhelm Buttercup, who sold their equipment to them, fair and square. It's not like she conned them, she didn't. They got complete use out of the things she sold them. Ultimately, the spoon just fails to emulate any sort of competently written characters or story and chooses to just waste our time with a bunch of incomprehensible nonsense that brings nothing to the table. All of this episode's failures, top with the unsatisfactory ending, easily contribute to this being in the top five worst episodes of the season, hands down. And with that, that's going to conclude part one of my top five best and worst episodes of season three. Thank you guys so much for watching and be on the lookout for part two where I continue my list with the number three best episode of season three. I'll see you guys then.